start. Uh, are there any questions before I begin uh, regarding what you read in the book? Uh, yeah, I mean, in, in the book, if if you if you went through the chapter, they do mention the let's say the idea behind the different methods, but they don't go into enough details to for for you to actually implement or even to understand the key features, especially if you go to irradiance caching or photon mapping or the tropolis light transport, you cannot obviously understand or implement uh, the method just from that. So technically you would need to read a little more. And what I have chosen to go into more details is uh, bidirectional path tracing. Why? Well, first, because um, it is unbiased. Second, because a lot of techniques use it, even in conjunction with other things. So for example, if you look at uh, a vertex connection and merging, or its extension to volumetric effects, then there you mix photon mapping with bidirectional path tracing. And also bidirectional path tracing falls uh, quite neatly in what we have seen until, until now. So it's uh, the extension from what we have uh, gone over to bidirectional path tracing is fairly trivial. That, that's why I chose that one. Uh, the... Well, for instance, I wouldn't say obsolete, but uh, there are improvements. For instance, if you go to photon mapping, nowadays you would probably use progressive photon mapping and adaptive photon mapping. So there are papers on that. And even then, you would actually mix it, as mentioned, with bidirectional path tracing to uh, be able to reproduce the effects of both methods. So... Uh, the effects that both methods are, are good at, you would try to reproduce both. And then there's an issue with the convergence speed of photon mapping. So when the convergence, so initially it's quite good, but then it's not uh, after you get to, you know, close enough to the solution. And then you would use uh, bidirectional path tracing more. So as described here, uh, this book is fairly old, honestly. So as described here, um, most of those are not... Uh, uh, at least you wouldn't use them in that uh, manner. And on the other hand, they, are, they don't go into many details. So if you look at newer papers, then uh, that would make sense. Uh, they, they, they just provided the idea. So that's uh, like, a, I don't know, like a, something to uh, as, a, as a reading material, basically to give you an overview of what techniques are available. Uh, and there, there are many, many papers on Metropolis light transport, on uh, bidirectional path tracing, like different methods. So uh, I'll, I'll just try to go over the basics of bidirectional path tracing. But uh, radiosity by itself, it, it's not obsolete in the sense that, well, radiosity is, as discussed in the last meeting, simply if you assume everything is diffuse. And if you have such scenes, that's not an issue. So you can you can compute that solution quickly. And then use it, for instance, to have interactive walkthroughs on uh, GPUs that are not as powerful and stuff like that. Not more. So if, if you want, you know, if you want to, for instance, go over more details of Metropolis light transport or bidirectional path tracing, one thing you can check. Just, just for the basics, because without the foundations, it would be very hard to understand papers that make extensions to those. So uh, one thing I would rec recommend is just looking at which thesis. Maybe it's a bit too mathematical. If, if you feel it's too mathematical, then you can look at uh, PBRT's implementation of those. Of uh, I'm talking specifically about Metropolis light transport, bidirectional path tracing, and uh, photon mapping. So that's that's one option. The other option is uh, there's a thesis by Ilian. I, I added that previously. Let, let me see. Can I find it? Uh, which goes over, for instance, uh, a vertex connection and merging, which combines uh, 
bidirectional path tracing and uh, photon mapping. Let's see. This thing, uh, there's also, what was it called? Small VCM. So there's this code, which is based on, uh, basically on his thesis and the uh, papers that he wrote for it. So that thing is code that implements uh, vertex connection and merging. Then there's BP, I, I think that was the name, yeah. And then there's this, which is an extension for uh, volumetric materials. So uh, they, they provide code, they provide the paper, but again, these are, let's say, advanced techniques. So be before you, I, I would recommend, before you tackle those, you should understand really well what bidirectional path tracing those does, and ideally you should have implemented a bidirectional path tracer. And uh, in, in the context of VCM, you should also have, uh, at least have an idea of how uh, photon mapping works. Obviously, it's not a problem to look at the code and look at the uh, papers, but if you feel stuck, yeah, just go, go back to the uh, found foundations, I guess. Uh, the, uh, which thesis gives you the, well, that, that's where Metropolis Light Transport and bidirectional path tracing was introduced, though, uh, uh, with respect to readability and, uh, you know, e e uh, h how easy it is to understand it, I, I probably wouldn't recommend it. So if, if, if you try to read it and you are fine, then, then that's okay. If you try to read it and you find it hard, I would recommend uh, maybe going to PBRT or to Ilian's thesis. Yes. Uh, they, they, they have chapters on uh, Metropolis Light Transport. So what, what's the issue with PBRT, with the book? But well, it's too focused on the specific implementation that they have. So uh, a lot of times the idea kind of gets lost in the, uh, in the details. That, that's the problem with that book. In, in which thesis it's the opposite. <laughs> the idea is there, but, uh, well, he also goes into some details sometimes. Uh, so, yeah, that's, I guess... And this time around, what I'll, I'll try to do is to, oh, not get the idea lost of a bidirectional path tracing in the details. And hopefully that would allow you to then easily understand, uh, let's say, if you, if you read Veech or if you read PBRT, having this, uh, like, uh, th th there will be an example that it will, I will uh, discuss today. So having this example, maybe it will be easier to understand uh, all the implementation, etc. Uh, other questions? Okay, then let's start. Uh, so yeah, I, I already mentioned why I'm considering bidirectional path tracing because it is an extension in some sense of what we've already seen and it's also unbiased and a lot of techniques uh, rely on it so it, it's found foundational in some sense. Um, so what, what, what is bidirectional path tracing about? Well, if, if you remember, so this is, a, for example, this is an image from uh, PBIT. You have a similar image in which uh, you, you can go to the original figure here. There's a ni nice caption ex explaining what's happening. W what I wanted to mention here was that previously, in Chapter 5 specifically, we saw two estimators. Uh, I, I can actually show those estimators. And then, then I, we will explain exactly what they do, because uh, I, I, I don't assume that everyone remembers these specific estimators, but okay, let's see. Uh, yeah, you have the solid angle estimator, and then you had a, for example, if you picked a specific density, a specific mapping, you could cancel out the cosine term, you could uh, cancel out the BSDF term if, if you sample according to the BSDF, or if you sample it according to the product, you could cancel out both the BSDF and the uh, cosine. And then you're left with variance in your estimator only from the light sources. Then you have the opposite. So this was simply sampling the BSDF at every bounce. So what happens there is you, you start, let's say, at your uh, camera, and then you pick directions on the upper hemisphere, either according, uh, either uniformly according to uh, the cosine or according to the BSDF or ac according to the product, and then, then you can do as many as you want of those. Um, 
yeah, so that, that, that was the solid angle estimator, the, the standard one uh, that you see in unidirectional path tracing. The more involved one was one where at some point you stop bouncing and you pick a point on the light source and then you connect those two. And if there's no occlusion, then you can take the contribution from there. So what, what was the, let's say, the advantage of this? Well, if you have very small light sources, then sampling the upper hemisphere would result in a very low probability of you hitting the light source. Now, if you pick a point directly on the light source, well, the probability is 100% that you hit it. The, the question is, is it occluded, though? So it, it, it was a way to uh, reduce variance. Also, if, if you have point lights, so infinitely small lights, then this technique uh, could never hit them. Uh, this technique here, since it samples the, the point light, it can sample such uh, light. So the, the, the two strategies uh, can, can sample different things. Similarly, if you use that technique and you have a specular table, so let's say a mirror, uh, then the only direction you can sample in is uh, the direction of reflection. So this strategy wouldn't be able to achieve that. So we, it cannot deal with that. So technically, both you should use both to uh, reduce variance. And how do you use both? Well, you combine the two estimators so here's the, uh, where is it, the direct light sampling estimator, and here's the solid angle estimator, and you combine both of those using uh, multiple important sampling to decrease the, uh, the variance. So basically to get uh, the best of both worlds. Now, except for those two, so starting from the eye, then bouncing according to the BSDF, or starting from the eye and uh, picking a point on the light source, there are other strategies that you can consider. And... We combine these two, but we could combine, for example, four strategies. What are the other strategies? Well, you could start at the light source, let's say here. You could start at the light source, which is known as light tracing, shoot a photon in, in a random direction, hit something, then sample again the BSDF, and hope that you hit the uh, camera film. So that, that's one possibility. Obviously, the, the probability that you hit the ca camera film is uh, low. So what you can do, you, you can do a similar thing as here, you could pick a point randomly on the light source, again, uh, shoot in a random direction, the photon, and then connect directly to the uh, uh, camera film. Now, if this is not occluded, then, then you get a contribution. So having these four strategies, uh, these different strategies are good uh, at, at different things. So by combining these with multiple important sampling, you can be basically get... Uh, um, let's say, the, the, the benefits of all of those. Now you can make longer paths, and then you get more strategies. Namely, here you have paths of length 2, so one edge, two edges. The, the number of strategies that you get is 4. Now if you have a path of length k, so with k edges, the number of strategies is k plus 2. Uh, you, you can check that. So the, the, the possible ways in which you can connect the vertices. Uh, questions up to here? Like, is, is it clear what uh, this is referring to? I, I can show you an image illustrating the... Where is that? Uh, the effect of different strategies. So if you go to which thesis on this page, you can see the different strategies and how they act. So you get a totally different thing. Maybe PBIT has them... Uh, enumerated, so that would be better. Let's see. Uh, yeah. Okay, so here they're enumerated nicely. Let's see. So, for instance, this is... Uh, what is that? Yes, for instance, this, this is three bounces, so three vertices away, so two bounces away from the uh, la from the eye, and you don't pick a point on the light source. Now you pick one point on the light source, and you do, do two bounces, for instance, for, for this image. Then you may uh, choose to take, let's say, two, uh, one bounce from the light source, so this thing, or two bounces from the light source. So, so you, can, you can construct your path both starting from the eye and from the light source. And th then you connect them in as many ways as you can uh, think of. So in, in this example, we, with a path of length 2, you can either 
use something like that, something like that, something like that, or something like that. Uh, let's let's look at an uh, instructive example, namely how this looks like in the, m m mathematically. Let's let's take this one. So let, let's assume that we start from the uh, camera film. We pick a point on the uh, film, so on, on the pixel that we are interested in. Then we generate a random direction that passes through the aperture. And through that direction, we find the intersection. So that would be point x0, x1. And then we would pick a point on the light source instead of sampling from here, a point x2. And then connecting these, we can get the contribution. So let's say a one sample estimator corresponding to uh, this strategy that we talked about. So the sensitivity of the film, the BSDF, for the bounce, the geometric term from the uh, from here to here, so I have, I've expressed it in uh, the area formulation, then the geometric term from here to here, that one, the occlusion, the visibility function, and finally the emission from the light source. Now you have the density for picking a point on the pixel, you have the density for picking a direction that passes through the aperture, and then you have the density of bouncing off that point here. So no, the density of picking a point here. So these are all the densities. Now, since you have already constructed the path x0, x1, and x2, what you can do now is say, OK, I already have the, that path. I already have these computed. What can I do to reuse that information? Well, I could. Reinterpret the density here. For instance, I could say, okay, I want to check what this strategy looks like uh, for this path. And in that case, this point here, it's not sampled on the light source. It's sampled with respect to uh, a solid angle sampling here. So you could compute the density with respect to sampling, let's say, with respect to uh, um, having a sample on the upper hemisphere and use that density. So here's that density. We've just replaced this density with the density of sampling something uh, something of the upper hemisphere. Now, that, that's for this specific strategy. You could take this strategy and say, OK, we sample the point on the light source exactly like here. Then, however, we found this point by sampling on the upper hemisphere st starting at the light source. So the density here would be different. And then, again, we sampled uh, on the pixel but that's the same density as here. So what changed is only the uh, how you sample this direction or this point specifically. And, and you get a different factor here. Finally, you can do the last, the, the light tra uh, tracing strategy, which says, OK, I also, so I sample this point here according to some solid angle density. And then I additionally sample the point on the light source uh, not, not the light, uh, on, on the um, image film according to some solid angle density. Uh, yeah, and, and you get a factor here. I, I, this, this actually should also say like P1ARC. Uh, yeah, I'll fix that. Uh, then you can write the products of these densities to get four densities for the four strategies. And you can use multiple uh, important sampling to combine this with uh, the following weights using, uh, let's say, the power heuristics. If, if, if you take, so this is from which thesis, if you take the beta to be one, you simply get the balance heuristic. Uh, so what, what, what we had seen previously was uh, the combination of uh, strategies A and B. Now, the only thing that changed is uh, we added strategies C and D. And we also reused that on the exact same path. So we constructed the path according to one strategy and then reinterpreted that same path according to the other strategy. So the only thing that changed in the estimators was the uh, densities in the de denominator. Uh, yeah, I, I think that concludes it. Uh, questions on that? Yeah. Okay, so um, let's say let's say I, I pick a 
random point in 0, 1 uh, squared, right in a, in, a, in a square, correct? So I pick two random numbers. Uh, both are in 0, 1. Uh, that, that should be clear. Then I want to take some transformation that maps this uh, domain to, let's say, to my pixel. And I, I, I take such a transformation, and, and let's say the transformation is uniform. Then I would get that the density of picking, of transforming this point here, my two random points, to a point on the pixel, is simply 1 over the area of the pixel. Uh, does that make sense? Uh, well, no, of the pixel of the pixel on the film, because you compute the solution for every pixel, right? Huh? Yes, p zero. So, but that that is that is the solution only for one pixel. So currently, I'm considering only a single pixel. This is the sensitivity function of a, of of a single pixel. So, this a e here is really the area of the pixel on the film. It's not the whole film, it's, it's the area of the pixel on the film, because I, can, I, I want to only generate uh, points inside my pixel, right? Because I'm estimating only the uh, energy that arrives at this specific pixel. Uh, like, is, is that clear? Wait, I, I, I want to find this just to make it... Okay, if, if you have a pixel, let's say, and let, let's say you represent that pixel with a point and two edges, then this is your mapping. So this, if, if you vary Rx and Ry between 0 and 1, you would get like a, a parallel, uh, either, let's say a re rectangle, if, if you in enforce that these two are orthogonal. So you would get a rectangle from that, a rectangular pixel. And you can use that mapping. And the the uh, the density of that mapping is 1 over the cross product of those, which really gives you the area. Uh, does that make sense? So now the... Yes, so now P1. P1, in this case, is uh, choosing a point on the aperture. But let, let's, let's look at, so technically you would choose a point on the aperture if, if you assume your camera is not a pinhole camera, so it, it has a finite aperture. And what you can do then is, well, you can sample a point using, uh, let's say, disk sampling. So you assume your aperture is a disk. You pick a point on it on a disk, and then you have this specific density. So it's simply one over the area of the disk. Uh, make sense? Yes. So so that's the second point for, for choosing, let's say, P1 here. And now for P2. For P2, you have what? So now, now you found this point by sampling the aperture. You, you find, okay, where does my ray continue on to? And you intersect something. And now you want to choose a point here let's say according to this strategy, right? Uh, and what, what you do is you, sam you, you sample the upper hemisphere. Uh, how can you do that? Let me find, do I have it here? I, I think I do. Yeah, so, so you, can, you can do a transformation of this kind. You can uh, take two points, again, random points in 0, 1. You can use this mapping here to transform them to the unit sphere, then you can offset the unit sphere along the normal, normalize, and you get a direction that is cosine distributed. Uh, make sense or may maybe too technical? Okay, so uh, to, to put it simply, if, if you generate a, a point uniformly on the sphere, and then you offset that sphere along the normal, and you normalize the point, you get a direction that is uh, cosine distributed. So the, the, the first part would be, uh, th that's also in the code that I have uh, shared on Shader Toy. The first part is generating a point on the unit sphere. You use this formula to do that. 
I haven't provided the derivation here, mind you. I, I can provide it if necessary. So I, I guess I, I, if, if, if people want to, I can try to make a cheat sheet of the derivations of stuff like that uh, at the end of the, uh, I guess, of the meetings, just so you can see where this comes from. But technically, it comes from inverse transform sampling, this thing here. Okay, so this is simply mapping a point in zero one uh, rect uh, square to uh, the unit sphere. And if your points are uniformly distributed, then this would also be uniformly distributed on the sphere. And the density of this is one over the area of the sphere. But you don't care about this density because you add an extra transformation after that. You offset along the normal. So you have, a, you have your normal at... Uh, here, so, so you've intersected this, you have your normal, you generate a point randomly on the unit sphere, then you offset all of the points like this, and then you normalize them and that gives you the direction which is cosine distributed. This is uh, probably the simplest way to get that, to, 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 to get a, a cosine distributed di direction without uh, uh, building an orthonormal basis. Uh, a simpler way, even simpler way, would be to generate, so take three random numbers, uh, check if those are in the unit bow. If they are not, reject the sample and try again. If they are, take them, normalize them, then that would give you uniformly distributed points on the unit sphere. So that would replace this math here. And then you can do the exact same thing and you get the uh, cosine distributed uh, direction. You could also, without doing these uh, offsets, th there's a way to also derive a inverse transform sampling uh, expression for, uh, for, for the cosine distributed direction. The only negative there is that it requires also building an orthonormal basis. I, I, I can go over those details, I guess. Yeah. Maybe, maybe after the last meeting, I can prepare, as I said, a cheat sheet with all of these. So you would know how to do this and maybe just add it in the code so it's obvious what what's uh, basically how it works. Uh, does that satisfy? Uh, I, I guess. Um, there's, a, there's a cheat sheet without the derivations. I, I can do one with derivations. Uh, let me stop that. Uh, Hmm. Guess this thing. Where is the PDF? This thing. Yeah. Okay. So that's a cheat sheet currently you can use. It doesn't have the derivations. What I can do is I can provide the derivations to those. Uh, it's also missing that uh, the, the thing I just showed. Uh, this is... so. Proving that this is the density of this is not very easy. If, if you know how direct deltas work, then it's easy. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so that's regarding how, how you would estimate, for instance, uh, uh, this density here. Also, this density here. So that was point C. So point C is this thing or this thing also. Because you, you would, for instance, you would pick a point on the light source and then pick a direction on the upper hemisphere. Same thing here. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Yes? Ah, because, well, technically in the, in, in this, well, I didn't have space technically. <laughs> <laughs> but in, 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 in some of these, you would have the visibility term. Here, I don't have it. Why? Because I'm assuming that this density here always passes through the aperture. So I, I'm assuming that I'm picking uh, my points to pass through the aperture. So I don't need the vi visibility term. But in... Yeah, so here, here, from this, it should be clear. From this, it should be clear that, okay, this point is the first point along this ray. Now, if, if, I, if I didn't use that, 
then then that would be a problem and you would need a visibility term. But in some of those here below, you would need the visibility term. I just didn't add it because, well, th there's no space. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sure. So let's 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 look at that. So for instance, let's say you're doing light racing, right? You pick a point here, correct? Then then you sample a point randomly, let's say, on the upper hemisphere, and you hit this thing here. So what are the two cosines? One cosine is the according to the normal here, right? And one is according to the normal here, according to this ray. Uh, make sense? Like Ah, a point, well, a point light source doesn't have a, a normal there. I, I, I think the, what turns out there is the cosine becomes one because you assume that the normal is exactly in the direction that you're shooting the ray. Yeah. But, yes. Yeah, so... For, for each direction, you actually say, okay, for that direction, the normal is exactly along it. But uh, point lights are, you know, a bit tricky in, 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 the, in the, so, yes, in, in, the, in here, uh, this function won't be a function anymore. It would, be, it would become a distribution, namely a direct delta. And then when you take the integral, so if, if you were to write the integral, when you write the integral, it would actually disappear due to the direct delta and you would, it would turn just into a sum. So if you have uh, point light sources, then you don't need to integrate over the, their areas, obviously, because they are just one point. It's the same thing with the pinhole camera, where you don't have to integrate over the aperture if it is only a point. Or the same thing for um, mirrors, for perfect mirrors. You only have one possible reflection direction, so they, there's no point in trying to sample other directions because they, they we, we yield a zero contribution, right? Uh, other questions? Yeah, uh, I, I was trying to finish the code, but didn't have the time. Hopefully, I'll be able to uh, finish the code so you, you can have actually uh, the, this basically this idea so you can see it in code at least in shader toy you, you can see how these are combined and then you see okay these are simply special cases the one of uh, direct light sampling and uh, bsdf sampling are special cases and you can also do the other strategies uh, yeah I, I think it would help having the code uh, so so you, you you can see okay what's the correspondence here and at the end, the cheat sheet should also help with the, I guess, with the code. So relating the math terms with the code. Uh, yeah. If there are no more questions, uh, I, I guess we can end it here. So thank you for the attention. And see you la uh, next time. Th that's the last meeting. I'll cover... What I'll, I'll cover, I guess, both uh, chapter eight and chapter nine because it's this is basically almost nothing, and this is some extensions, so not not anything much. It's m mainly you know ideas and telling you okay what happens if you do volumetric things, what happens if you do subsurface scattering, what happens if you do spectral things, uh, stuff like that. So fairly interesting in in terms of. Uh, uh, ideas fairly slow in terms of computation <laughs> so all of these extensions technically make the problem quite slower uh, yeah yeah so thank you and uh, feel free to go thank you see you